Welcome. In this section, we're going to go over some geometric considerations and tolerancing and assembly of optical systems. So starting with geometric considerations, often optical software does not prevent or warn you when you're making a design that is not realistically manufacturable. So to ensure a manufacturable system, it's important to consider several details throughout the design process. So a few important ones. It's good to overestimate lens diameter by a millimeter or so early in the fabrication process, because if you have a prototype and you need to remove some material of an oversized lens to make it fit, that is much easier than adding material to an undersized lens. You should keep the edge thickness above 0.7 millimeters approximately and not make the edges too sharp. Too thin or sharp edges can result in breakage or damage of the component. You should maintain a Karo Z factor above 0.56. Uh, the Karo Z factor is a measure of a lens's ability to self-center itself between two bell chucks. So if the lens has too flat a radius of curvature or too weak of a radius of curvature, the lens will not center well and you'll end up with a misaligned system. Additionally, if the lens is too small, the lens may not fit between the bell checks properly and need to be manually centered. You should keep the concentricity above two millimeters. It's lenses with nearly concentric radii are difficult to center since a large amount of material must be removed to correct for surface-to-surface -surface relative decentering. You should keep the center thickness of a lens intentionally thick when designing. Processes such as adjusting surface quality after main lens production will naturally lessen the center thickness, so having a little extra can help mitigate these factors. And you should avoid hemispherical, that's nearly round lenses, as well as nearly flat lens surfaces, as they're difficult to manufacture and can be hard to align. We should note that for all of these suggestions, they're merely suggestions. Every product and every project will have its own set of specifications, and every rule may be broken under certain conditions. When tolerancing, what we're looking for is the permissible limit of variation in the physical dimensions or properties of components. So there's some allowable deviation from the exact design file that should be possible without damaging the performance of the system. So for example, this over on the right is a figure showing a hole and a bolt that is supposed to fit within the hole. Both the hole and the bolt have a size and there is some range of sizes that is still acceptable where the bolt will still fit within the hole, but is not so small that there's too much wiggle room. So what you find acceptable in this case is going to depend on what your exact project is. Generally, the tolerancing process is somewhat cyclical. We start by defining the qualitative properties for merit requirements, so what properties are going to play into the merit function or the function that tells us whether the system is performing well enough under the tolerances. Then we need to estimate the tolerances of the components we're using, then define and assemble the system so that we can estimate how all the different tolerances will combine to create the entire performance of the system estimate the performance of the system, then adjust the tolerances, allowing for balancing between quality and cost. So you may find a lens, if you get it a more high precision, may cost more, but the quality of your product will improve sufficiently that it's worth doing. Then there's some iteration of the process with engineers, fabricators, and management we can all give feedback on different components. So fabricators can tell you what is feasible in terms of tolerances. Your management can tell you, can we still meet the timeline? Is the cost on track? And the engineers actually assemble and test these systems and then repeat. 
Manufacturers will provide specifications on the tolerances of the optical components they provide. So for example, this is the Edmund Optics page with capabilities. And if I scroll down, we can see for different optical components, a table is provided with the tolerances for the various parameters of that optical component. So for example, for a spherical lens, we could buy one that has a thickness with a tolerance of 0.1 millimeters for commercial grade. This is the cheapest option. If you're willing to spend more, the precision can be increased with high precision manufacturing. So depending on the need and specifications of your project, you may choose for more or less tolerance in your optical components. Monte Carlo simulations are a method that is used to see how the tolerances from each individual optical element will combine to affect the system as a whole. The way this works is values are chosen at random from in the tolerance range for each element, and then they're combined to see how the system operates. This is repeated many times to create a probability distribution that shows the possible outcomes for making this assembly with this set of components, with these tolerances. Generally, the distribution will be some sort of normal distribution with some most likely outcome. Ideally, this most likely outcome will align with the performance that you desire from your system. Then there will be some tail of probabilities where the performance is not ideal but acceptable. And then out in the far region of the tail, you may end up with a possibility of an unacceptable performance. If this is unlikely enough, say one in a million, it may be all right that one in one million of your products that you produce is defective. The precise numbers on that will depend on the specifications for your particular project. Sometimes the distribution is not symmetric. It may be a skew distribution. The important thing is to make sure that your peak probability aligns with the desired specification and that the tail does not include too many outcomes that are unacceptable. So with outcomes of Monte Carlo simulations, what it really allows us to do is analyze how individual fabrication and assembly of a single unit will perform given components that may have varying tolerances. And engineers can use this to dictate whether tolerances on a design need to be tightened or may be loosened and still have proper functionality of the product. So a few tips on tolerancing. Generally, don't go beyond three decimal places unless necessary. Uh, more decimal places is very high precision and will lead to higher costs. For lens components, keep a one to eight thickness to diameter ratio minimum. For handheld optics, this is like binoculars or other types of optics that will be operated by hand. This does not apply to fancier high precision optics as you might find in high-end microscopes. You should maximize the self-centering of components. This allows for easier alignment as active alignment is time consuming and costly. So onto some other tolerances we need to consider. Not only do the parameters that will affect the optical performance of the component matter, the parameters that will affect how the component is aligned in the system will matter as well. So for example, a diameter tolerance of a circular optical component is the acceptable range of values for the diameter. And if we look at this lens here, essentially it has these spherical surfaces, but the point at which it's been chopped off at each end is asymmetric. This optic could still perform exactly as specified if appropriately aligned. However, when put into a holder in a optical mount, its optical axis may dis be displaced from its mechanical axis, meaning its performance will deviate. So some of our tolerances will affect our performance in terms of assembly though not of the individual optic itself under ideal conditions. The way we can test for these types of things is known as centering, also as centration or decenter, and it's specified in terms of beam deviation. 
Beam deviation is calculated by shining a light through the lens, and you look at where that is focused. As the lens is rotated, that spot will make a circle if the lens is decentered, and the distance from the center of that circle to where the beam is focused is the uh, displacement of the beam, and the beam deviation is the displacement divided by the focal length of the lens. Once the beam deviation is known, we can calculate what we call wedge angle using the refractive index of the lens. So wedge angle is beam deviation divided by refractive index minus one, and this plays into calculating things having to do with tilt. Many factors will assemble lenses into assemblies, and these assemblies have to perform within specifications. Physical assemblies have some degree of deviation from ideal specifications due to these decentering and tilt effects. Optical assemblies require additional attention to individual element wedge and tilt, as well as system level stack ups as elements and spacers push against each other that are subject to limitations of the inner diameter of the barrel. Stack up models should attempt to accumulate the tilt and decenter effects of the lenses while keeping elements anchored to the optical axis. So here's an example of what this may look like. There is a barrel and a lens is pushed into this barrel against some spacers. A tilt effect would be something like this where the lens rolls in the barrel causing it to be tilted off of the desired location. Decentering effects are when the lens slides side to side causing it to be decentered from the mechanical axis of the barrel. These effects can couple from lens to lens with spacers. So if we look over here, we have three lenses and a barrel, which are all well aligned. But if we roll this first element, because it's connected to the second element through spacers, causes that to roll, which will transverse down the barrel. The same thing can happen with decentering. If the first optical component becomes decentered, that can lead to decentering of further elements as well. So in stack up of assemblies, we need to have simulations using Monte Carlo to model how the different tolerances in terms of tilt and decenter will combine and affect the final performance of the optical assembly. So to model a system, we have to ensure each Monte Carlo iteration is configured with the correct stack up of element tilts according to the element arrangement in the assembly. So that's, is there both tilt and decenter, and does the tilt of one lens couple to the tilt of other lenses? So three approaches are shown here, uh, where all elements are tilted by two degrees. In the first, each lens tilt is independent of other lenses, so every lens is tilted two degrees off of the optical axis represented by this red line. In the second system here, Tilt and decentration are accumulated from one lens to the next. So as the tilt and decentration both occur, we see that the tilt is decentered further from the optical axis. And in C, we see that tilts are accumulated in order of assembly, but there's no additional decentration. So we can see that each tilt is two degrees greater than the previous tilt but we're not accounting for any decenter. So which of these models you use is going to depend how the lenses are going to couple to each other in the barrel. When putting these systems together, there's two choices. There's drop-in assembly and active alignment. Drop-in assembly, lenses are simply dropped into a barrel with the center of the barrel defining a common optical axis and the lens is rest on mounts and centered in the barrel by press fitting. For this to work, it requires that lenses self-center due to the pressure and the curvature of the lens causing it to align with the center of the barrel. Drop-in alignments are much cheaper and faster to assemble and they're desirable for mass-produced products. Active alignment 
is the case where after each lens is put into the barrel, you do a centering. So a light is shown through the optical axis. And if there is any decentering, the lenses are adjusted using set screws to center the laser. Then the next optical element is added and the process is repeated until the assembly is complete. Active alignment takes much more time, is much more expensive and time consuming, but might be desirable for systems that require high precision and are not going to be mass produced. This has been Geometric Considerations, Tolerances, and Assembly. Thank you for watching.